Hi, I'm Susan Taylor with Scripps Health in San Diego, California. So, you're pregnant. Congratulations, how exciting. But now what? Are you feeling a little nervous, a little overwhelmed? There is so much to consider as you enter one of the most magical times of your life. Here to talk about planning for the birth of your baby are Dr. Kirsten Lee, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, California, and Andrea Montiel, who is a certified nurse midwife also at Scripps Clinic. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, so you're pregnant. Ah, after the screaming and the jumping up and down, you know, now what? What's the first thing you should do? Well, so we tell our patients to call the office to make their new OB appointment. Um, often when people find out they're pregnant, they're often newly pregnant, just missing their period. And so we usually make the appointment for eight weeks after their last menstrual period. And they will make that appointment, but we encourage them to call if they have any other questions before then. Um, so talk about the different stages of pregnancy. Uh, let's talk about the first trimester, the first three months. What do you need to do? The so first three months, um, again, we see our patients at their eight-week visit. Um, we get their medical history, their family history, genetic issues that run through the family, um, medications that they're on, talk to them about their diet, exercise, travel history. We um, do an examination and we also get them set up for the first round of lab work that we do. And what, what kind of blood tests are you, what are you looking for in that case? So we check their blood type, we check their blood count, make sure they're not anemic, we make sure that they're immune to certain um, viruses like rubella, which is German measles and chicken pox. Um, we do um, a check for sexually transmitted infections. Um, and we also make arrangements for them to do a first trimester um, California Street screening program for Down syndrome and uh, trisomy 18. What's, what, what's the second one? It's called trisomy 18. It's where instead of having two of chromosome 18, two pairs, um, the baby has three pairs and it causes um, birth defects, uh, developmental delays, and, and can be fatal in the baby as well. Oh my goodness. Yes. Um, all right, so what about the second trimester, the second uh, three months? What do you so, do then? So we usually see our patients a couple times in the first trimester, and then the second trimester, um, we see them for their second trimester screen, which is in addition to that first trimester, we do additional blood work and get a final calculation of Down syndrome, trisomy 18, and also check something called alpha fetal protein which screens for certain birth defects of the brain in the spinal column. And during that second trimester, mm -hmm. they also get an ultrasound? Yes, so we do a 20 week, around 20 weeks, anatomy ultrasound. Um, and that is looking at all parts of the baby. We look at the amniotic fluid, the placenta, the length of the cervix, the uterus and ovaries, and, and check all of that out as well. And then? The third trimester, the last three months. <laughs> last three months is when things, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. different, but obviously different discomforts, sleeping <laughs> positions, um, swelling, different things can happen. We're checking every visit that we see our patients, their blood pressure to make sure they are not having blood pressure issues in pregnancy. We also check the size of the uterus, make sure the baby's growing appropriately, not too big, not too small. Um, some of our patients have additional ultrasounds in the third trimester if they're considered high risk or they have twins or um, certain medical problems that we would worry about the growth of the baby. Um, toward the last few weeks of the pregnancy, we're also checking their cervix to see if their cervix is starting to dilate. Uh, we do a, a vaginal swab for something called group B strep, um, which is not an infection in women, but it's a bacteria that can, can cause an infection in the baby mm -hmm. um, during labor, so we like to check for that. And you're checking the position of the baby, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yes. To make sure they're Head down. It's not, a, it's not a breech birth. Yes. And then what about um, swelling and preeclampsia? What is that? Yeah, so preeclampsia is a condition where blood pressure rises. There can be protein in the urine. Um, it can cause certain abnormalities in kidney function, liver function, and a blood test called platelet count. Um, so it is a condition that has a wide spectrum. It can be mild, moderate, severe, depending on when it occurs in the pregnancy. Um, if it's toward the end of the pregnancy, we recommend delivery because it can become more severe. If it's something where the patient is not close to um, delivery time, then we put them at bed rest, follow them very closely for changes in that. And uh, talk about prenatal care. What does that involve? So prenatal care, we basically have our patients come in, depending on where they are in the pregnancy, it's usually about once a month. Mm -hmm. um, they come in, we check their blood pressure, we listen to the baby's heartbeat, we check the size of their uterus, ask them about, about symptoms they're having, go over their lab work with them, tell them what to anticipate for the next you know, few months. Um, we, we also encourage our patients to call at times mm -hmm. other than 
during their prenatal visits because they will get all sorts of advice from everybody around them because mm -hmm. they are pregnant. <laughs> so we're open to <laughs> phone calls and they also can email us mm -hmm. as well. So we encourage that communication. And then perinatal care, what is that? So we um, have a nice team of perinatologists who are maternal fetal medicine specialists and we work very closely with them. Um, they see most of our patients for their first trimester nuchal translucency ultrasound, which is part of the California State Screening Program. It's part of that calculation for Down syndrome and trisomy 18. But they also work with us for our patients who are considered high risk. And high risk can be a variety of things from age related, if women are um, over the age of 35, if they have underlying high blood pressure or high blood pressure in pregnancy, diabetes or gestational diabetes, lupus, all sorts of different issues, twin pregnancies, sometimes we have them help us with our twins as well. How do you know if you're having a high risk pregnancy? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, you don't know until you go to the office and we check your blood pressure and it's mm -hmm. elevated. Um, other times you have something that even before you were pregnant, we know that it may be a high risk pregnancy and underlying medical conditions. So, and that would be like what? So high blood pressure, diabetes, different autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. can cause problems in pregnancy. Um, if women have had blood clots previously, pregnancy makes mm -hmm. them more prone to having deep vein uh, blood clots, things like that. Mm -hmm. Gastrointestinal disease? Some gastrointestinal diseases can be problems in pregnancy if they don't absorb well, if they've, um, for example, Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. ulcerative colitis can be problems in pregnancy, but sometimes you may have these problems and have a perfectly normal pregnancy, and mm -hmm. that's often the case too. So what should you eat during pregnancy? <laughs> well, a well-balanced, healthy diet, like your mom always told you to, yep. is what you should do in pregnancy. So basically, you know, well-balanced, plenty of protein, variety of vegetables, fruits, dairy, you know, kind of grains, all of those things. Um, there are certain restrictions we recommend, not having raw meat or fish in pregnancy, just for certain foodborne illnesses, mm -hmm. or there's also a um, a disease called toxoplasmosis that you can get from eating raw beef. Mm -hmm. um, we do think fish is very healthy in pregnancy, but trying to avoid the fish that's high in mercury. So tile fish, um, swordfish. swordfish, absolutely. Um, some of the fishes that just hang around in the ocean a long time that have a lot of mercury. So mm -hmm. they recommend no more than eight to 12 ounces of fish a week. Mm -hmm. um, obviously avoiding caffeine, smoking, drugs, um, unless they're <laughs> drugs that you're uh, doctor has prescribed that they recommend you continue in your pregnancy. Um, some caffeine is fine in pregnancy. They recommend no more than 200 milligrams of caffeine daily as long as it doesn't make your blood pressure higher or things like that. Does that, so that, does that include coffee, tea, and chocolate? Every chocolate, yeah. yes. Yeah. You have to include Everything. the chocolate in that calculation. Everything. Okay. And then um, what about uh, alcohol? Uh, we recommend avoiding alcohol during pregnancy. Um, alcohol use can be one of, can cause something called fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and we don't know a lower limit of alcohol that's safe, so we recommend just avoiding it completely. And what about exercise during pregnancy? What should you do and what shouldn't you do? So for most women, exercise is great in pregnancy. Um, many women can continue what they've been doing prior to getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. We definitely discuss it at the first prenatal visit, or sometimes even our patients come in before they get pregnant, and we talk about that as well. Um, certain things that we recommend against are any contact sports. So if something could hit your abdomen, obviously we want to avoid that. Um, and contact sports are different. For some people, contact sports could be tennis, mm -hmm. and depends on how you play tennis. Or For other people, a bike. or riding a bike, mm -hmm. exactly. So um, we recommend things like skiing, snowboarding, scuba diving, um, things where you could fall. Um, so horseback riding, unfortunately, we recommend against as well. Against it. But uh, running, if you're a runner, if you're a runner, you should, you mm -hmm. can you go out and run for an hour? We don't recommend running an hour. Usually, 30 to 45 minutes for mm -hmm. most women is going to be adequate. Um, they recommend even 150 um, minutes of aerobic exercise a week is mm -hmm. recommended by the CDC. And that broken up in like 30 minute increments, you know, five days a week is, is a nice way to exercise. Now sometimes there are gonna be times when we recommend against pregnancy mm -hmm. exercise. Um, if a woman's in preterm labor, having vaginal bleeding, obviously if her bag of water is broken prematurely, um, there's certain times that we would ex recommend no exercise at that time. Okay. Um, Postpartum depression, you're having a baby, everything should be great, you should be ecstatic, over the moon, happy, and yet uh, you give birth and you're depressed. Um, we're going to talk about this in a couple of minutes, how common postpartum depression is, how to treat it as well. Um, 
Andrea, let's talk about um, the midwife program. What is sure. a midwife? Um, a midwife is a healthcare professional that is trained to work with women during the course of their pregnancy, their labor, and post delivery. And how does the midwife interact with the labor and delivery team? When do you start seeing patients? Um, here at Scripps Health, we have several midwives that are in each office. Um, those midwives, unfortunately, do not deliver at the hospital. Um, so the team that you will meet in the hospital is all brand new. Um, we have a team of eight or nine midwives, um, and we function as hospitalists. So basically, we come into the hospital for shift work, um, and we care for our team of doctors, our 20 doctors. So we care for all of the patients that come through, through the doors on our particular shift, um, as long as they're within our scope of practice. So the hospitalist um, nurse midwife, do they actually deliver babies? Absolutely. They do. Mm -hmm. How many do you deliver a month? Um, average is probably about 100 a month. Really? Mm -hmm. That many? Yeah. Okay. It's fantastic. Um, and mm -hmm. let's say something not so great happens during birth. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the neonatal intensive care units at Scripps. Um, what are they? What do they offer moms and newborns? Yeah, our, um, we have a wonderful um, relationship with the uh, Radies Children's mm -hmm. Hospital. Mm -hmm. Neonatologists, um, the neonatologists, the nurse practitioners, the um, ALS nurses, the respiratory therapists, um, so we work very closely with them. They come to a lot of our births. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually an ALS nurse and a respiratory therapist at many of the births. Just, just there as a precaution, and most of the time there's not an issue, which we're very grateful mm -hmm. for. But we are really happy that they're in the hospital because they can help us with babies that may need extra attention, oxygen, um, if there's an infection and they need antibiotics, if they're born preterm and they need extra support. We have the level three NICU. Mm -hmm. That's right there. So when you talk about um, the hospitalist nurse midwife versus the OBGYN delivering your baby, what should the patients be asking in terms of labor delivery? Um, and, and one of the questions is who will deliver the baby and how do you mm -hmm. decide who should deliver your baby? Um, I'll go, yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, most of the time, if, they're, if the physician is on um, and it's their personal patient, they will care for their patient. Sure. Um, otherwise, we take care of everyone that comes through the hospital that is low risk or within our scope of practice. So that can vary slightly depending on, on the case and the person. Um, we always offer um, or explain to the patients who we are, what we do. Um, the beauty of the way that our program works is that we have two physicians that are in-house every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, so every 24 hours, those change to new physicians. Um, and so if we run into a pickle or if we have something that we're not happy with that's going on with the baby or the mom, um, we collaborate cl quite closely with our physicians. So they're in the room within 30 seconds. Um, our patients do have the option, which we offer every time that we meet them, whether or not they're comfortable with midwifery care. And if they're not comfortable with midwifery care, we then pass them on to the physician. Okay. And what is a lactation consultant? So a lactation consultant is um, usually a, a registered nurse who has done special training in helping women with breastfeeding. Um, we have lactation consultants who are always in the hospital helping our patients. Um, with their breastfeeding and, and our postpartum and nurses are amazing with that as well mm -hmm. So there's a lot of support because it definitely is an art to be learned mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And it may not be perfect by the time women leave the hospital So the nice thing is once they're home with their lactation support groups Consultants that they can mm -hmm. go see they have consultants that come to the home and help um, So we feel grateful for that for that support. So it's the breastfeeding group. support talk about preventing breastfeeding pain no, I think I want to add yeah, on to Dr. Sure. Lee as well. I think one of the other beautiful things about Scripps Health is that we have a nurse that comes over, a postpartum mm -hmm. nurse that comes over after every delivery and really takes over um, and helps that mom during that really beautiful golden hour. Mm -hmm. um, and we really try and help, especially our first time moms, get that baby on the breast and really utilize that time that the baby is alert and aware of what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, so I think that's mm -hmm. a really fantastic um, asset that we provide for our patients. So really trying to honor that for them. Sure. And how long would you recommend that someone breastfeed? Well, it's, it depends. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I mean, breastfeeding is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want my patients to define themselves yeah. as a mom by if it doesn't work. But when mm -hmm. it does work, it's really healthy. Um, I think most pediatricians mm -hmm. recommend exclusive breastfeeding through the first six months, and then mm -hmm. they start introducing different foods. Um, if a mom can breastfeed the first year of life, mm -hmm. it's great. Some women choose to do it longer. So it's a really individual thing. Okay. So then the breastfeeding support preventing that breastfeeding pain, what, what does that entail? 
Well, sometimes it's going to be painful yeah, um, because yeah. honestly, most women, that's not what their breasts have been used to before. So, mm -hmm. but to help prevent the pain, we have um, some of the women need nipple shields that mm -hmm. actually can help protect the, the skin of the nipple. Um, when engorgement happens, we teach them different things mm -hmm. about maybe they need to pump or ice, exp mm -hmm. ice is great. Mm -hmm. He, believe it or not, cabbage leaves. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic. Can freeze help. them. You totally. freeze them. You freeze them and you put them in yep. your bra mm -hmm. and whoever bottles whatever's in that cabbage leaf will make a lot of money because yes. it's it really <laughs> it's does beautiful. work. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Um, and there are breastfeeding support groups and classes, are there not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're yeah. all throughout San Diego County? Yes, all throughout mm -hmm. the county. Um, definitely accessible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, talk about the breast pump to actually uh, help you breastfeed. Yeah, so a lot of our patients um, get their breast pumps during the pregnancy. It's covered by insurance now, which is mm -hmm. great. So they can um, get the prescription from us in the office and get their breast pump and have that at home um, before they deliver. Uh, in the hospital, while they're there, there are pumps in every room that they need to be pumping. Again, that's something that the postpartum nurses or lactation specialists mm -hmm. will consult with them on. Um, if they want to rent a hospital grade um, breast pump, that's available as well. It's a little bit stronger than the one they would have at and home. And they would rent that mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then talk about childbirth preparation classes. What does that include? We have amazing childbirth mm -hmm. educators and classes. We're so grateful. We work really closely with them. And so there is just basic childbirth preparations. They go through what to expect in labor, mm -hmm. um, how to deal with the pain of labor, what, what epidurals are, what cesarean mm -hmm. sections look like. Um, and they you know, go through all of the birth process. Uh, we also have lactation, a breastfeeding class, which is great. Um, and yes, husbands are welcome to mm -hmm. that too. Um, there is a grandparents class. There is a siblings class. Oh, no. There is a dog and baby class. <laughs> no way. Mm -hmm. We love our dogs, and so we want them to be ready for their world changing when the baby mm -hmm. comes home. So there's all sorts of support. We're because somebody else is now going to be the main focus of attention. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, that, and it's that way for siblings too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes. so there's that's there's a there's a the class for siblings yes, as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, that's and great. that's and that's kids' ages what? I think it's three to three and six. A, three and above. Yes. Okay. And um, let me come back, uh, Andrea. If somebody comes into if they come into the hospital and you know they've had their OBGYN following them throughout their mm -hmm. pregnancy, what is the difference that you say to them between the OBGYN delivering them and a nurse would nurse midwife delivering the baby? Um, you know, I think the model of care that we as midwives believe in is really promoting a continuous and compassionate partnership between, <clears throat> excuse me, between the patient and the provider. Um, we're notorious for spending a really exuberant amount or a lot of time by our patient's bedside. Um, we believe in skilled communication, so providing our patients with exact um, and current information so that they can make an informed decision based on their care. Um, we really try and honor what, their, what they want their birth experience to be. Um, obviously within medical reason, um, we, we can do any type of delivery. We, we deal with, um, we do any type of laceration repairs except third and fourth degrees. At that point we would involve our physician. So now what, is, what does that mean? Um, so laceration or tears of the perineum are graded on uh, certain levels. So we have level zero, which is nothing. We have one, um, two that goes into the muscle, three goes through the muscle to the rectum, and four goes all the way through the rectum. Okay. Um, so as nurse midwives, we do not want to repair third and fourth degrees. Um, so we really would involve our, our physician at that point. Um, and thankfully they're rare. They're rare, very yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, we don't do surgery, but we can assist with surgery. Okay. So if, they, if there was a need for us to come into a C-section, we would do that. Um, but we do not do any type of surgical procedures. In the office, so it's, 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 in the hospital. it's, it's the, the nurse midwife is basically there to hold your hand through the whole process and guide you through it. Absolutely. Sure. Um, but, you know, our goal really is to provide an environment where our patients feel safe, they feel mm -hmm. heard, um, and they feel like they're in control of what they want it to be. Um, we're there to provide what we think our best recommendation would be with the information that's given. Um, and really try and keep them safe and their babies safe. Um, but we're notorious for being, they call us the watchful waiters, mm -hmm. um, meaning that we, we really believe in the normal process of labor, mm -hmm. um, but we understand the value of technology and intervention and we utilize it when it's necessary. Okay.
We feel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, we no, feel no. so grateful for the team that we have. Like it's, it's such a nice collaboration. The doctors and the midwives mm -hmm. are there together. We know everything mm -hmm. that's going on with the patients that they're taking care of. So mm -hmm. if we meet them as well, so if there's something that comes up and we need to come in and, and help out if we can, then, then we've already met those patients. Um, we've learned a ton from our midwives, <laughs> so we've tried to become watchful waiters as well. Um, and interestingly, the other thing that is an amazing asset is our labor and delivery nurses. Absolutely. They are just angels on earth and, and are going out of their way to help, help our patients. Even we get, have gatherings that are not work related to learn about spinning babies and getting babies in the right position mm -hmm. so they can come down in the pelvis easier and different positions in labor and pushing and so it's an it's an amazing team there what i tell my patients all the time is that they really have the best of both worlds mm -hmm. they really um, have the every opportunity to create their experience the way that they envision it um, but when or if anything goes a little bit off track we're we're there to right there. really mm -hmm. help them through it um, we, t we referenced this a couple of minutes ago. Let's come back and talk about postpartum depression. How common is it? Um, how do you treat it? Um, postpartum depression, unfortunately, is very real. Um, what I tell my patients, and it's part of my education every time I discharge a woman, um, because I don't think that it's talked about enough, um, mm -hmm. is that 85% of all women will have postpartum blues, which is different than postpartum depression, and it's very common. Um, what it is is that women will feel overwhelmed. They'll cry at the drop of a hat. Um, and sometimes they'll feel a little bit sad, and that's all very normal. That's part of being a new mom. And is that because of hormones or lack of sleep? Or? I think it's a combination yes, of both. And yes. Yeah. yes and yes. Okay. And it yeah. usually takes about two weeks for those hormones to settle. Oh, um, so usually I tell my patients, be prepared for that and be, mm -hmm. and be forgiving to yourself and to your body. It's just done an amazing feat for you. Um, and be good to it. Um, what I do warn them though is that if it persists, so if it persists past a couple of weeks or if it's really exaggerated for your character, um, so I tell them if they're crying all the time, they don't wanna leave the house, they don't wanna hold the baby, touch the baby, feed the baby. Um, sometimes also postpartum depression will manifest, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Lee, um, in just abnormal behaviors for their personality. So mm -hmm. I've had women present with oh my goodness, I've checked my baby's weight every 15 minutes mm -hmm. for the last 12 hours and I'm really nervous about it. Or they're checking their baby's temperature every hour. Um, it's very common to wake up in the middle of the night and make sure your baby's breathing. Mm -hmm. That's very normal. Sure. Um, but when it's exaggerated for, for your personality, it then becomes a problem. Um, and about one in eight women are affected with postpartum depression. So how do you treat it? So I think education is the biggest mm -hmm. part of it. And the patients absolutely need to be educated. The, the partners, the family members, like sometimes when you're exhausted, you may not be mm -hmm. assessing yourself as well as you could. Mm -hmm. So education is huge. We talk about it prenatally at the hospital. Um, we also, every time a patient comes in postpartum, they fill out a postpartum assessment form and it's actually a test. Are you feeling overwhelmed? And it, yes, no, sometimes, you know, it's, and it's sure. graded. And we use that form to refer people to the Postpartum Health Alliance, which is an amazing group of therapists that specialize in postpartum depression, anxiety, any mood disorders associated with having a new baby. Because it is different. And there is a very fine line between being exhausted mm -hmm. and overwhelmed, mm -hmm. which is a normal reaction to having postpartum depression. So we definitely encourage people to call us with that. And is it medication? Is it antidepressants to treat it? A combination. combination. Mm -hmm. yeah. The therapy is really important. Mm -hmm. um, getting plenty of sleep, trying to do more naps. Um, but yes, absolutely, there are um, antidepressants that are safe with breastfeeding. We encourage women who need those that they feel comfortable taking mm -hmm. them. Um, and it may continue for many months, and, and that's fine. Okay. I think the biggest thing, Susan, is that I really want women to know that they have no reason to feel ashamed if they're feeling really badly after they just had their baby. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest factor in preventing healthcare professionals from helping women is that they don't want to admit that they're feeling crummy because sure. um, they feel terrible that they're feeling crummy after mm -hmm. they just got this beautiful gift. That's true. Um, so I want women to know that they have a very safe place to call. We're not going to pass judgment. We're just going to make sure that we, best them, that we help them the best way we can. And then um, keying off of that, when you get home, how do you take care of yourself? 
while mm -hmm. you're caring for your baby. I mean, uh, they yes. always say, you should nap when the baby naps. Absolutely. <laughs> That's actually very good advice. Very good advice. Take advantage of people mm -hmm. around. Let family members do the laundry, clean the house, feed you, all of those things. Mm -hmm. They want to be there to help. Um, definitely trying to get naps when you can. Mm -hmm. um, eating well is always good to maintain, you know, breastfeeding support mm -hmm. and um, continuing with the prenatal vitamin and mm -hmm. call if you have questions or concerns. Mm -hmm. And then what about creating a safe environment for your baby um, when you bring the baby home? Well, baby proofing the house. Well, right? yes, and that will, that's, that, there's an evolution of that. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, sure. the babies don't come home walking, so right. that's a blessing. Um, the pediatricians are great at guiding mm -hmm. along the way, so we recommend that babies sleep on their backs, so mm -hmm. um, they will recommend, you know, some stomach time, but sleeping on their backs helps decrease the risk of SIDS death. Mm -hmm. um, Which, and SIDS is? Um, sudden infant, infant death, death syndrome. syndrome. Okay. A terrible, tragic thing, that, but that does help prevent that. Um, again, getting animals mm -hmm. ready so cats aren't trying to sleep with the yeah. baby and things like that. And it's good to know as providers if they have animals at home, sometimes we will save blankets that were used with the baby um, and yeah. send them home prior to the baby going home oh, so that their animal can get familiar with their smell. With the smell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we are more than happy to help. Who we knew? just need to know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? Well, it is an amazing thing. It's a wonderful journey. Like I said, the whole world will feel the need to be involved mm -hmm. with um, the process. It's a natural process. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature does a great job, um, but we're also there to help with medical side of things, and we, we're there for you. And the great thing I want to let patients know is that we're available 24 hours a day, seven days mm -hmm. a week. Um, so that's key. That's key. Mm -hmm. 24 so hours a day, seven days a week. just because the office is closed does not mean that you can't get a hold of a provider. Um, so the way that our system works is that you would still call your primary OBG, OBGYN's office, but it would get shuttled to a message center and you'll get the midwives in the in-house and we'll call you back. We'll walk you through whatever we can over the phone mm -hmm. um, and we'll invite you in if we feel like it's necessary. Sometimes they're very easy questions. Um, sometimes they're more involved, um, but you're not by yourself, so there's yeah. always somebody available. There's somebody to help you on this mm -hmm. journey. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. This spectacular journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. We really appreciate Thank you taking you. the time. Thanks. Uh, according to U.S. News & World Report, Scripps is ranked as one of the top healthcare systems in the nation. If you would like more information on planning for the birth of your baby, just click on the link or go to scripps.org forward slash videos. If you want more critical information about your health, we take care of you from head to toe. We take care of you from birth throughout your entire life. Um, please subscribe to our Scripps Health YouTube channel and then follow us on social media at Scripps Health. I'm Susan Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. It's our mission at Scripps to help you heal, enhance, even save your life.